Okay. Well, I guess we'll just go ahead and get started. Um, or did you click it? Okay. All right. So let me play with the clicker and make sure I know how to use it. Okay. All right. I think I can. I think I can work that. So uh, before I get started, won't y'all join me in a, a word of prayer, real quick? Um, thank you, Father, for safeguarding our our souls and vouchsafing our our hope for eternal life. We ask that that. We look at that hope, and, and that hope gives us courage to be fearless when defending our faith and also when reaching out to others, Father. We ask that you bless our studies today so that we may strengthen that faith. We may learn something that we can take and, and use in, in our daily lives. And we, uh, we thank you, Father, for ensuring your word was brought to us and was preserved for us for our study and for strengthening of our souls and, and for our ability to win others over, Father. And we, uh, we, uh, we pray that, that, that we don't miss opportunities through our, our daily lives, uh, that we don't miss those opportunities by not studying and not being prepared for opportunities when they present themselves, Father. We pray this in your Son's holy name. Amen. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is kind of a recap of the, the, the first um, lesson. And, and one of the important things I think to take from that as far as moving into um, um, Peter's sermon, is that Luke was a very reliable, historically speaking, writer. And that was one of the things that Roger did a real good job pointing out, was how we can look at the, at the book of Acts and look at all the people and the places and the events that took place, and historically speaking, it's accurate. And that accuracy leads a lot of credence and importance uh, to the, uh, the account of the day of Pentecost because, um, because Luke could be counted on to be accurate in his accounting of the scriptures. So before we get moving too far, I do want to stop and watch a video by Kyle. Christmas? No. Did he take off for your birthday? No. 
pioneers of training the evidence put on the single day. That's why in 2008, when he showed up at the Olympics, he could win eight gold medals because he was prepared. Well, now we look back to the story of Peter. Peter happened to be in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, said he really would have gotten the point that brings into existence the church of Jesus Christ. Well, how is it that when he preaches this message, 3,000 people respond are baptized into Christ, and the Bible says that the Lord adds them to the church. How is it that Peter was so very successful? Now, the simple fact of the matter is, Peter was prepared. You see, it wasn't that he was accidentally in the right place at the right time. And many other people could have been there, but they wouldn't have been able to preach this message. Why was it that Peter was so successful? Well, there are several reasons. You know, one, he was in the right place. Well, why is that significant? You know, Peter could have been anywhere else. After the death of Jesus Christ, and he rose from the grave, but Peter and the, the other apostles, many of them, didn't know what was going to happen. And so they decided they were just going to go back to their old job of fishing. And I don't know if you remember the story, but Peter and several of the other apostles went fishing, and they were in that fishing boat, and they pulled up a large number of fish and realized that Jesus Christ was on the beach, and when they got there, Jesus was preparing a meal for the young man, basically breakfast, and Peter realized, okay, this is the resurrected Lord. Jesus explained to them that he wanted to remain in you know, Peter. He wasn't good at waiting, was he? He had, he had disobeyed that God and Christ many times. And what I mean by that is when they went into the garden of Gethsemane and Jesus told him to wait here and pray because very profound things were going to happen. Peter many times was not prepared to help in a situation, but this time on the day of Pentecost, Peter did exactly what Jesus said and he waited there in Jerusalem and he was a Uh oh. Are we stopped? I'll tell you what, go ahead and cut. Because I think we got the main. Um, main points he was trying to make which, which are relevant to, to what I'm going to be talking about today which is um, being in the right place in the right time and being prepared and, and I don't know if, y'all, if you caught it or not but when he said how many days do you take off and he kind of skipped over that part but the answer is zero. He took zero days off. He was completely committed to his goal of, um, uh, of, of getting the, uh, of earning an Olympic gold medal, and since he was seven years old, and um, now doesn't mean from seven until then he never took a day off. But for that five years leading up to the uh, Olympics, um, he never took a day off. And and that type of commitment is kind of what we need to do, I think, if we're going to to be able to reach others. And um, oh, anyway, let me get back into this. So. Peter was ready, and um, uh, let me back up a little bit. And one of the things that that Kyle was talking about, being in the right place, a lot of times, because we're spatially oriented, we think about being at the right physical place. And I think that one of the more important things is actually to be in the right spiritual place. And because uh, you can't always be in the right physical place, um, but you can always be in the right spiritual place. So if you don't mind, I'm going to look at um, Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. I wasn't smart enough to mark all these. Verses 10 through uh, 20. It's a little bit of a long reading, so stay with me. 
Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and faith, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having all, excuse me, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, with which, excuse me, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplications in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So I find comfort and and, and encouragement in knowing that even Paul felt like he needed he needed people to pray for him, to be bold, and to have courage. But the important thing I, to me that, that Paul is talking about here is preparation. It's preparing yourself for, um, for being in the right state of mind, in the right place. Um, he's talking about putting on the whole armor of God, girding up your waist with truth, putting on the breastplate of righteousness, taking the shield of faith... All of these things, uh, as a retired soldier, all of these things, I know that he's preparing himself for the difficulties that are to come, and 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 to be able to fight the good, uh, to be able to fight. So, and the other thing that that we need when we're when we're working with um, um, uh, preaching to others and teaching others is power. Now, the power is different. Because today than it was then, because at that time um, God actually spilled out His Spirit on the people that that uh, who they laid hands on. Um, so in Romans one sixteen, let's take a look at that real quick. Romans one sixteen for in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just live by faith. Um, 1 Corinthians 2, 4, and 5. I'm going to be skipping around for just a second. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. And my speech and my preaching were not with uh, persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should be in the wisdom of men. I'm sorry, faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So our, our Bible is our power. That's the power that we have because God has provided that to us. And so you have to have, you have, to have an understanding or at, at the very least a study of the scriptures in order to um, be able to exercise that power. Uh-oh. Can you? Does it show? Oh, okay. Did, did I pause too long? Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and read before I get too far along and lose my time. I'm going to go ahead and read the uh, Peter's sermon, and then we'll okay. Then we'll go back and we'll uh, um, revisit a few uh, points in there. Okay. Um, so this is after uh, the uh, the uh, the crowd has seen them speaking in tongues, and they all marveled. And of course, they're talking about you know. Uh, uh, these, these men are full of wine. So Peter stands up. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words, for these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. 
Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence." Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to, to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on this throne, he, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption." This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witness, therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And skip down to verse 40. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Okay. So, so Peter used reasoning when he was addressing them. So, one of the things that he said when he was addressing them was that it was the third hour of the day. Now, I didn't know this at the time, or I didn't know this until recently, but the Jews start their day at 0, 06 in the morning as far as, uh, as far as the hours of the day. So this was about 9 o'clock in the morning, and, and, and let's be honest, in today's, in today's um, society, if somebody says that they were drinking at 9 o'clock in the morning, a lot of people would not be surprised. But at that time, um, especially since these were, um, uh, what, what's the word that they were looking at? Um, uh, I, I apologize. Um, uh, these, these were not just uh, um, the average people of the time. These were Jews who were, uh, were believers, and these were people who were more or less devout, at least in the Jewish faith. I say more or less devout because, of course, some of them may have been involved with uh, or been there at the hanging of Jesus, may have even been some of the ones yelling, crucify him, crucify him. But, um, but the point is, is that he used logic when he was uh, talking about that at the time of day. Um, let me go on. So the nature of the power on display. So when... When he was talking about um, the nature of the power, that, when they're uh, um, talking about it, apologize. The point is, is that they were not gibbering. They were speaking in tongues. And no amount of drink, now it may help you, it may, I shouldn't say help, it may make you speak gibberish, but no amount of drinking is going to help you to speak in other languages. Does that make sense? So that's one, of the, that's one of the main points that were brought out. The time of day, which we've already discussed. And then the prophecy of Joel. 
Now, one of the things that I used to struggle with is that I read that and um, it, 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 I didn't understand why it wasn't all of that happening right at that time. Now, so it's very important when you read that it, it does say in the last days. And that last days actually refers to the period um, after um, the resurrection of Christ, right? The establishment of the, the, the kingdom on earth, but before the second coming of Christ, before he comes back and returns for final judgment. So we are in the last days. But these, thing, these prophecies that Joel is talking about was talking about um, um, the, the wonders, the miracles that were being performed, the, uh, the people who were prophesying. Um, so 1 Corinthians, I want to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, talking about prophesying. That was, that was uh, um, evident in the, in the early church. Uh, verse 1, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Verse 24, um, but if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all. He is convicted by all. Verse 31, um, okay, for for you can all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be encouraged. And again in verse 39, Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid, I'm sorry, do not forbid to speak with tongues. So prophesying was definitely something that went on in the early church as it was predicted by Joel. And the point, the point of that is that it's not something that, that happened only at that time, but it went on during the early church. Um, so the prophecy of Joel uh, 2.38, that there's a difference in, in the wording on, on, um, on, on what's actually in Joel. Let's see, 2, 38, 28 through 32, sorry. Oh. Helps if you start in the right book. All right. Sorry about that. I was like, I only see 20 verses. Okay. And it shall come to pass afterward. So that's the part I wanted to stop on is just the word afterward. Um, but it's, it's commonly understood that where he's saying afterward, that that's also talking about that time after or in the last days. I may come back to that in a little bit. Okay. So I'm just going to move through these pretty quickly. I will pour out uh, of my spirit on all flesh. So, of course, when he's talking about that, he's not talking about everybody on the planet. The point was that, that not only would Jews receive his spirit, but also the Gentiles. So, and that was um, played out. Um, when um, uh, when Cornelius was uh, baptized, let me make sure I get that right because I have been known to throw names out from the front. So Cornelius, uh, let's look at uh, Acts chapter ten. Verse three, about the ninth hour of the day, he was clearly uh, he was clearly in a vision. An angel of God coming in and saying to Cornelius, no, I am. I knew I was talking about the wrong thing. I apologize. So that actually has to do, what is it, Lord, your prayer? Send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. No, that is. Okay, send for Simon Peter. And then that's when Peter had his vision. And then Peter uh, went uh, to go see them. Uh, I apologize. The point is, is that uh, it was poor, he poured his spirit out to, uh, to all flesh, meaning to Gentiles as well as to the Jews. Uh, sons and daughters shall prophesy. Um, so Philip had four daughters. That uh, Just so you know, that, that they specifically mentioned in Acts 21, verse 9. Acts 21, 
Acts 21 and verse 9. Um, now this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. So, right, Philip, okay, the evangelist, okay. So he did have daughters that, um, that evangelized. I, I think it'd be silly to assume that these were the only daughters that evangelized. But the point is, is that that was all part of that prophecy in Joel. Your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, and I will show wonders in heaven and signs in the earth below. I think one of the things that, that he, that, um, I think his name was Roper. He took time. Okay, I'm going to wait. I'm getting ahead of myself. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So Mark 16, 16. Anytime I read something that, that talks about calling on the name of the Lord, I always like to go back to Mark 16, 16. Because, um, I care what are they? Sixteen, sixteen. Go into uh, uh, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. So, calling on the name of the Lord, right? The Jews would have understood this a lot differently than we do because they. Um, they, they oftentimes uh, were told to call on the name of God and calling on God for help and calling on Him for, for salvation. So for them, it wasn't, it wasn't that unusual of a saying, but they understood that it means more than just saying, save me, it has to do with obedience. Yes? Well, a good one, I think, to go along with this is Acts 22, verse 16, where Paul is recounting his, his own and he talks there about calling on the name of the Lord. But it's interesting where in that verse it, it appears. But um, let's see. Uh, verse 16, Ananias tells him, uh, why are you waiting? And now why are you waiting? Arise me, baptize, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. But it's the activity of immersion into Christ for the remission of sins. That that's just what you're talking about in Mark sixteen sixteen. And I appreciate that because you're right that that really shows how it ties that together. It's not it's not just uh, I. I 10.30 last night when I was sitting there, I was, I was, I was going over my notes, and, and I was thinking how odd it is that some religious factions believe that you can say this like it's a spell, and it somehow obligates God, like he's a spirit, just a spirit that has to do what you've asked him for now, because you said the right words, and it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. But I want to make this about that. <laughs> But it's a good point, and I think it's an important point to remember that there's a lot more to calling on the name of the Lord than just, than just going through uh, words. Uh, Peter uh, used revelation when he was, when he was uh, making his case to these gentlemen. And um, I think that one of the important things is that, that he was going somewhere with all of this. He wasn't just defending themselves. He was actually going somewhere with all of this. And it becomes more evident when he starts talking about the... Uh, I think he's lying. I keep forgetting my watch is off. So, oh, I need to move. Okay, okay. <laughs> so the miracles of Jesus, <laughs> are, the people who were there, a lot of them either, either will have heard about it or will have seen um, Everything that, that Jesus, or many of the things and signs and wonders that Jesus had, uh, had performed. Now, one of the things that I was reading from uh, Mr. Roper, is it David Roper? Anyway, I, I promise the name later if you, if you really need the name. But, but in, uh, in his commentary, he's talking about the difference between the terms miracles, wonders, and signs. So, miracle is what was done. In other words, it just, it's something that happened that's not explainable by natural science and, and natural 
um, explanations. The term wonder refers to the effect of a miracle that it had on people. So people were in wonder. Now the term sign refers to the purpose of the, of the purpose of the miracle. So that's why when Peter was talking about that, um, those were important for them to hear that, that it wasn't just something that was amazing, but these were signs to show who Jesus was and to show that he was the Christ. Uh oh. There we go. So the crucifixion of Jesus. Now, at that, the law of Moses said in Deuteronomy, as Paul quotes this in Galatians, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So at the time, that's one of the reasons why the Jews had so much trouble seeing. That, um, that Jesus was the Messiah because they didn't see the Messiah being, hang, being hung on a tree. They, they saw him as coming, right, in power and glory and, and, and setting up this worldly kingdom. Um, but it, that's why it was a stumbling, jo uh, stumbling block for some, the Jews, and a foolishness for the uh, Gentiles because um, they couldn't, uh, they couldn't um, uh, put that together. Um, the resurrection of Jesus. So I didn't think about this when I, when I went through this the first time, but there were likely people in that audience who had seen Jesus after his resurrection. Um, because it, oh, I lost my scripture, but there were like 500, mentioned 500 people who saw him. 1 Corinthians 15, 5. A little birdie just told me. <laughs> yeah. Michelle's surprised I heard that without my hearing aids. So I'm going to go ahead and go there real quick. Um, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. So there's a reference to to the fact that there were many people who had seen Jesus after he had, after he had arisen. So it was observable. So there were people who had seen it. And some of those people may have even been there at that time. Oh, here it is, 1 Corinthians. Okay. It was inevitable. So why was it inevitable? Because God determined it. He was the Son of God. And no grave could hold him. So it was inevitable. It was historical. There's no body. Nobody can point to a tomb and say, that's where his bones are. And don't ring that bell. So, <laughs> so it was historical. And, and, and you can rely on that because Luke was such a good historical um, Writer, and it was explainable. It doesn't seem explainable to us, or maybe not in a scientific terms, but it was explainable for the uh, for that time. And actually, that I'm going I'm to zip through the rest. So the ascension of Jesus and the position ascension and position of Jesus. So Jesus sat at the right hand of God, right? Like Joel was talking about, and that was a very important point because when David, I said Joel, but when David was describing the fact that I was sitting by the right hand of God and, and my body did not meet with corruption and, and my body did not and my soul did not stay in Hades. He couldn't have been talking about himself because at that time the Jews knew where David was. They knew where his bones were laid. And so um, they, they finally had it explained to them who David was talking about when he said those things. So readiness is our responsibility, logic is our friend, and scripture is our miracle. Yes, sir. I was just going to say that in a certain way today, we call on the name of Jesus when we're baptized because we publicly state that we believe that he is the Confession. Son of God. And now whether there's three people there or 300 people there, you still do it. Right. And so in a way, that's the same thing. Does anybody else have anything? Well, thank you very much.